Welcome everyone. Um, we've got seven o'clock here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Cindy Finiseth with the Kentucky Horticulture Council, and we are so glad to have you join us this evening. On behalf of our planning committee, let me start my video here so you can see who I am. Um, on behalf of the planning committee, I just wanna welcome you to this first session of our three-day direct marketing mini summit. In 2019, um, the Kentucky Horticulture Council received a Farmers Market Promotion Program grant from the USDA AMS to focus on direct marketing of ag products in Kentucky. And little did we know then just how important and profitable direct to consumer sales would be to our producers and indeed all of agriculture across the United States. If you aren't growing specialty crops, please don't be put off by the Horticulture Council is the lead partner tonight. We have worked very closely with all the other members of the planning committee to be sure the content applies to all of agriculture, regardless of the actual products you're selling. We'd originally planned a full day multi-track educational program for last month. And like everyone else on this webinar, we had to rethink our careful planning. We knew there was an opportunity to share valuable information with producers and our pivot was to organize this three evening mini summit covering topics that can really help boost your farm revenue. At the end of the summit, we'll send out a survey link that we really encourage you to complete to give us feedback for future planning. I have a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, tonight is webinar style, so you don't have to worry about the camera or the mic. The dog can bark, the kids can yell, and it won't disturb anybody. If you have questions or comments as we go through, please type those into the chat or the Q&A feature in the Zoom panel. We'll keep an eye on that on both those and work with the speakers to answer your questions. If we don't make it through all the questions, we'll follow up with the speakers and then post responses and any additional resources on our event webpage. If your internet goes out, or you lose power, yay, we're all living in icy weather, experiencing it myself today, don't fret about it. All the sessions this week are being recorded and will be available for viewing after the summit. We'll send a message to that email you used at registration with all those links so you can catch anything you missed or if you wanna re-watch any of the sessions. Our plan is to do that next week as long as this winter weather cooperates. I know you're already tired of hearing from me, so let me turn it over to the marketing experts. Our moderator for tonight is Bethany Prokopa, and she's our direct marketing program manager at the Kentucky Horticulture Council. Bethany, the webinar is all yours. Thank you so much. What an introduction. So as Cindy said, I am the direct marketing program manager at Kentucky Horticulture Council. And also like Cindy said, do not be deterred if you are only growing specialty crops or you are involved in meat and eggs or something completely different. This is for everyone. So we are excited to have you. We were overwhelmed by the response that we got um, for this summit. So we actually had about 660 registrants. Um, that is amazing. We're excited to see the numbers after we post the video and just to see the huge interest that everyone has shown for this. So, um, we are going to thank all of our partners. So if you got here early, you might have seen the um, slide that we had showing. So we just wanna thank Kentucky Department of Agriculture, Kentucky Farm Bureau, KCARD, UK Ag Econ, UK CCD, and then the Center for Profitable Ag at University of Tennessee. We have really not been able to do any of this without them. So we are so grateful to have all of them and just you will see the work that they've done over the next couple of days. Um, I would also like to show you, so like I said, 660 registrants, we spanned across the country in those and actually outside of the United States. So we had a few across the world and that is amazing. So I will just show you a quick map that we did. Okay. So this is just, you know, the regional area. We have lots of interest in Kentucky and Tennessee, of course, and then just a few across the other states. This is a zoomed in of Kentucky. So all across the state, there has been interest. And this is just great to see. Um, 
we have really been pushing promotion over the past couple of weeks. And it's amazing to see that we got this kind of response. And then this is the United States. So we had some all across the country, which was great. This is the first year that we have had this. So we just look forward to this getting bigger and bigger. And like I said, I can't show the actual large map, but we did have a few other countries. So that is absolutely amazing. And we can't wait to hear feedback from everyone. So without further ado, I will get into our first speaker. So our first speaker is Amanda Kelly. She's with Southeast Kentucky Economic Development Corporation. She's an experienced training director, social, social media manager, and small business coach. She's been with SCED since 2015, and in that time, she has developed their digital marketing program, Be Boss Online. I can't think of anyone better to speak on creating a digital presence for you and for your business and the basics of social media platforms. So Amanda, without further ado, will you take it away? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bethany. I appreciate the introduction. I am going to share my screen and get going with the PowerPoint. Can you see that okay, Bethany? That looks great. Okay, perfect. All right. So like Bethany said, I'm the Small Business Trading Director at SCED, and it's my job to help all small businesses grow, whether that's agriculture or any other business. So We've, we've developed a, a Be Boss Online curriculum, and I'll tell you more about that towards the end, but I've got a lot of slides to go through, and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly so that we can get through everything, and I've got much more in-depth information, if you're interested, that I can get you in contact with. So the first thing, before you even start your digital marketing, you, you need to understand what your customer journey looks like. You need your customers to be aware of your business. They need to consider uh, purchasing from your business. Then they need to make a purchase. You need to retain them as repeat customers. And then you need them to advocate for your business and bring other people to your business through them telling you about, you know, what your product is and how, it, how it's great and how they love it and sharing it with all of their friends, bringing you new customers at no cost. So I'm going to focus on the digital marketing side of this right now, and but I wanted to leave the traditional up on the screen just so that you could see it. So for awareness with digital marketing, your social media posts, email marketing is another great tool. Online ads and Google Maps are great tools to help people be aware of where you are and where they can find you. Consideration for digital marketing are any ads that you run on social media. Uh, reviews that your customers leave, your website can be one, uh, blogs that you write, and friend shares. So when, when friends share your content on their page, their friends get to see it. That allows people to consider making a purchase from you. Purchasing is really the same, whether it is in traditional or digital form, either in person for farmers, a subscription service would be an option, e-commerce is another option, just depending on, on what products you have and, and how you get those to market. Retention, when you're retaining a customer, you're trying to get them to come back and purchase multiple times. So social media interactions that you have with those people allow them to continue to purchase from you. Customer service that you handle via the internet, via social media, if somebody has a question, they can reach out to you on your Facebook page. You can answer their question and, and they can then realize that they really do want to continue doing business with you. Tagging customers and pictures. If, if you have a customer come and purchase something and you take a picture and post it on social, tagging them gets you in front of all of their friends. Uh, sharing content that your customers post is another great way. And, and commenting on those posts and just acknowledging them is a great way to provide that interaction that you need for retention. Uh, community forums is another way where you can reach out and answer questions, help people be educational. But the key to all businesses is the advocacy piece. You really need these people out there talking about your farm, your products, what you offer, and bringing new customers to you at no cost. So digital marketing, could that could include social media shares, 
forwarding newsletters that they receive via email, forwarding any sales promotions that you have, and then just customers following your social media platforms. Advocacy is really where you want to be. The more advocates you have for your farm and your business, the easier your marketing is going to be. So here's what that looks like if, if we put it all in a picture. So you've got the awareness, consideration, and purchase, but then we get the retention and the advocacy, and then they come back to purchase and the retention and advocacy, it just keeps going in a circle. And that allows you to really maximize the effect of one customer on your business. So let's kind of get into the meat of the social media. We're going to cover some tips, tricks, and tools and best practices to help you reach your customers online. We, first, we need to understand who our target market is. Who are, we, who are our best customers, the ones that advocate for our business? What do they look like? Um, we're going to talk about Facebook for business. We're going to talk about Instagram for business and email marketing. So when you're looking at your target customers, you, you need to look at some of their demographics, their age, gender, income, family status, education, occupation, hobbies, and interests. Those are the things that kind of tie your very best customers together. When you're doing online marketing, you can target these specific groups and really maximize the amount of money that you're putting in making sure it's getting in front of the right people. So where can we find our customers? Our customers, 90% of internet users have email. So obviously email is a, is a great way to get in touch with your customers. 72% of US adults use social media. YouTube is really, really high and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Facebook, 68% of adults are using Facebook and 37% are using Instagram. The other ones are very useful too, but I only had 25 minutes, so <laughs> I could only cover so many things. Um, where you can find your customers, if you're looking at some demographics, age 18 and under, students, they're into video games, Instagram, YouTube, and Snapchat are really the places where you can reach those folks. Age 20 to 30, have college degrees, are quote unquote foodies. They can be found on all platforms that are on this slide age 31 to 55, family type. Uh, you can find them on Facebook, Instagram, email marketing, and YouTube. Age 56 and up, close to or retired, really Facebook and YouTube are the way to reach those folks. So you'll notice that we're, we're covering Facebook, Instagram, and email marketing. YouTube is the one platform that reaches all age groups. And we're, we're not covering it as in depth today because I think that you can make faster um, business, you can, you can improve your business faster with Facebook, Instagram, and email marketing than you can YouTube. YouTube's a little bit of a longer play. So, but if you can get the hand, hang of some of the stuff we're gonna talk about in Facebook, YouTube will be pretty easy. So the biggest thing on Facebook is first of all, make sure that your farm has a personal, does not have a personal Facebook page. It has to have a business Facebook page. The best way to tell which is which is the add a friend, which is circled in red on this slide. If it says add a friend, that is a personal page. If it says like, follow, and share, that is a business page. And the reason that you really want to make sure that you have the business page and not a personal page is personal pages are limited to 5,000 friends. Business pages have no limits. You get insights, which are some analytics with Facebook that help a lot. You can run ads. You can also assign admins to help you run your Facebook page and you can schedule content. So you don't have to actually go on every day and post something. You can sit down once a week, come up with all your posts for the week and schedule when they're gonna go out to your audience. With Facebook, your best practices are going to be, you need to understand that Facebook has a really, really broad audience and it is a social platform. You need to post content that is highly relevant to your target audience, to those advocates of your business. Know who your target market is and make your posts less promotional and more informational. And towards the end, I'll give you some, some kind of general statistics on which where you need to be there. With your page, make sure you have a ton of photos. You need to have a great 
um, cover photo, a great profile picture, and then you need to have albums in there where people can really see your products and what you have and your farm and what you offer and everything about your business, behind the scenes stuff, all of that. So there are a number of different types of Facebook posts that you can put out. You can just do a plain post with just some writing, maybe a, a colorful background. The photo post is always good. People love looking at pictures. Sharing your customers' posts are great. That makes your customers feel special, plus it gets you in front of a new audience. Win-win for everybody. Educational posts are great because they help people. The promote an event post, which you can see I use the, the direct marketing summit post that was on Facebook, use those, but above all else, use the go live option. That is hands down the best way for you to reach your customers and get the most engagement out of any other post that you can do. And everybody's scared to death of Facebook live. I promise it's not that scary and it works better than anything else you can do. Uh, I go live once a week and talk to businesses, I, I put classes on, I do all sorts of things. Every week I am on Facebook Live and you really need to be too. Insights are analytics for Facebook and they allow you to tell how your posts are doing, what's working and what's not working. Um, this is just a screenshot of SCED's analytics from Facebook. And you can see post engagement towards the bottom, we're up 46%. Video views are up 19%. Tells us if what we're doing is working. On Facebook Insights, you can also see what your demographics are for your followers. So SCED, women are there on the top side of the graph, men are on the bottom side of the graph. And you can see that we really focus between 35 and 64 is, is really our sweet spot. So Make sure what you're posting is resonating well with that demographic because that's who's following you. You can also see how your posts have done. So this is just a screenshot of some, some of our recent posts. And the top one is one of our Facebook Lives. You can see that obviously it does better than anything else. It reaches more people, but then the blue and pink tab show us our engagement. I get more engagement from these Facebook Lives than I get on any other post type that we do at SCED. Uh, you can also schedule your posts. Uh, when you're making a post, you've got the share now button. If you click that little drop down next to it, uh, the little triangle, you can click the schedule button and then you can choose when this content is gonna go out to your customers. So it saves you time not having to do it every day. Groups are another great way to engage on Facebook. You can join groups that work well with what you offer and you can offer insight, education, helpful hints and tips and tricks for the audience in those groups because you know that they have a shared interest. Instagram for business, you create a business profile the exact same way that you create a personal profile. If you already have a personal Instagram account, you'll wanna use a different email address when signing up for your business. Uh, Instagram account, but then you just go into your settings and you're going to click the switch to business account that you can see circled in red. Super easy to, to make that a business account. And just like on Facebook with Instagram, you get the insights with your business account. And those insights are really, really useful. This is a screenshot. I know it's a little bit small and I apologize, um, but you can see that you've got, you can tell how many Accounts have been reached by your posts in, I'm looking at the last 30 days on these. You can see which days you've reached these people. So you can tell which posts are really working and which ones are not. Breaks down your followers and even gives you some top locations of where they're located. Make sure that if you're selling locally that you are targeting folks in your local area. Uh, but then it also, on the far right, you can see posts and it, there's a little box in all of those that tells you how many people each post reach. So you can really tell which ones worked and which ones didn't and adjust your strategy going forward. Uh, some Instagram best practices. Posts with locations get 79% more engagement than posts without locations. So adding a location to your post is a great idea. Instagram users engage more during the week. Tuesdays and Thursdays have the most engagement. And Instagram videos, just like Facebook videos and Facebook Lives, get two times more engagement than just photos on any other platform. 
videos and lives are the way to go, guys. Your best time to post on Instagram is going to be between 11 and 1 p.m. and 7 and 9 p.m. The worst time to post is 3 p.m. Um, Instagram videos posted at 9 p.m. get 34% more engagement than ones posted at other times. Um, the other thing I recommend on Instagram is to use hashtags. So you can make up your own hashtag for your business. You can find one that works well with your audience. I do recommend researching, typing in the hashtag into a search bar just to make sure that it's what you want. But hashtags do help you reach more people with the right message. Here are some examples of some Instagram um, posts that you can do. The one on the upper left is an event. So there was an event going on and they put it on Instagram, told their audience what was going on. Uh, top right is an interaction post. They were actually closed on this particular day and it said, enjoy your day of rest, see you Monday morning. You're just staying engaged with your audience, even though your business isn't necessarily open at that time. Uh, promotional Instagram posts. So let, you know, let people know what products you have available and what they can come by. And then services available. If you have a subscription service or if you do gift cards or any other thing, you can add those to Instagram as well. These just help you reach the audience with the right message at the right time. So the last thing that I, I wanna cover before we get to some, some tips and tricks is why choose email marketing? Email marketing is probably the one thing that most people shy away from the most. And really it should be one thing that you're using beyond all others. And the reason is because it's cost effective, you have some automation capabilities with it. So it doesn't always require your time and attention. It's measurable. I can tell exactly how many people open my emails. I can tell which ones open my emails. I can tell when, you know, who clicks on what links. So I can tell if my emails are working or if I'm annoying people and they're starting to unsubscribe from my lists. The other thing is you own your contacts. With Facebook and Instagram, they're private companies. And if you do something that is against what they want, then they can just turn off your account and you have very little to no recourse. With email marketing, you never lose the ability to contact your customers. Um, for about every dollar you spend on email marketing, you will receive about $40 in return. So it's a great ROI. Um, and people are three times more likely to share content on social media if they receive emails from your business, your farm, whatever it is. So what should I email? That's what everybody asks me. How, you know, what should I send out? And newsletters are great. What's happening on your farm? What's going on? What products are you offering? What services do you have? Any event promotions and educational information for your audience? People have so much information at their fingertips. They, they really love to learn. And if you can help your audience by giving them a recipe, a tip, a trick, Anything that has to do with what you promote and what you sell, that will help your business. In your email, you definitely need to include a clear call to action. Your email needs to be mobile friendly. Most people will open these on a mobile device. And you can automate emails. So if somebody signs up for your newsletter, you can set up an automation to where it automatically sends them a welcome email without you having to do anything. You don't even have to realize that they've signed up for your newsletter. So that really helps you save time and create good customer engagement with your emails. Best practices, send your emails at about 11 a.m. Tuesdays are by far the best day for email marketing. Use fewer images. And the reason that on this platform you want to use as few images as possible is because they load slow and don't always load properly on all different types of browsers. So plain text emails are going to work the best. If you don't get your emails out on Tuesday, Thursdays have the second highest level of engagement and the weekend is third. So try to avoid Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So what works? Rating Taking a look at all different types of, of marketing and, and digital media, email marketing works the best, followed close second by social media marketing. 
So this is really why I've chosen to focus on these two areas is because you're going to see the quickest return on investment, whether that be money or time with email marketing and social media marketing. Facebook has the broadest audience, which is why we focused on that. And Facebook also owns Instagram. Instagram is very photo centered. And if, if you have food products, food products do amazingly well on Instagram and it's going to give you the, the viewers that you need for your business. So here are some tips, okay? Anytime, if, if you're posting something, using words, the strong marketing words like sale, free, limited time, limited supply, these create a sense of urgency with your customers to do something quickly, which is what you want. Ask questions in your social media marketing. Posts with questions receive 92% higher comment rates. Facebook is very reliant on algorithms to decide what to show to who. And the higher your engagement rate, which is that back and forth communication between you and your customers, the more they're going to show your content to other people. The 80-20 rule is 80% of your posts need to be social in nature. And only 20% should really be marketing and promoting your products and services. So don't get on there and just promote what you do. Be social. Ask questions. These questions can have absolutely nothing to do with your business, your farm. That's okay, but it engages your audience. Uh, always respond to customer interactions, good or bad, within 24 hours. So people, if people reach out to you on social, they want to hear back. Um, some other tips before posting anything on social media, ask yourself, is what I'm sharing useful, interesting, informative, entertaining, or will it help my audience connect with me or my brand? If the answer is no, just don't post it. Um, you can really polarize your audience by posting the wrong thing. And I've, I've seen a lot of small businesses, particularly in the past 12 months, get into trouble with this, putting things on their business page that really doesn't need to be on their business page. Um, some great ideas on what to post would be quotes. These could be inspirational quotes. Those work really well. Behind the scenes photos are great. Behind the scenes videos are even better. Give people a look at what your world is. They want to get to know you and they, they want to feel like they have a personal connection with your business. So allow them to have that. Offers and discounts are always great. Even competition announcements. If there's somebody else hosting an event that is a bit of a competitor to you, that's okay. Because chances are you share a lot of the same customers. Uh, videos are always great and recycled content. If you don't have anything to post today, it's okay to recycle something that you posted six or 12 months ago. Above and beyond everything else, be a good friend. So if you want more comments, respond to the comments that you receive. If you want more shares, thank the people who are sharing your content. Treat others the way that you would want to be treated online and in person. Like, comment, and share other people's content too. It's not just about your farm, your business. It's about what other people are posting as well. So like I said, I've got just a minute or two left. I've got a ton of content that is made solely for small businesses. And it is step-by-step -step how to set up your Facebook page, how to do email marketing, how to make a website, how to do all sorts of other things on digital marketing to help grow your business. If this is something that you think might help you or your business, all you've got to do, my email address is on the screen, uh, my number is on the screen, all you've got to do is reach out to me and I will do everything I can to, to help get you the content that will help you and your business grow. So, Bethany, that, that's about what I've got for the presentation. I was within my time. That was wonderful. I have a page of notes myself, everyone. So even if you think, oh, I don't know if I'll get anything from this, that was, that was amazing. And we do have a number of questions. So I'll start off. Um, for Facebook Lives, what do you consider engagement in terms of analytics? So Engagement could be somebody commented either on the video or after the video was posted. It could be a like, it could be a share. Um, those things are counted as engagement on the social platforms. Okay. 
Um, someone asked, how come Facebook Live reaches more people than regular post? Is there specific research on this? Uh, yes, there is specific research. It has a lot to do with the Facebook algorithms. Facebook puts a higher value on the Facebook Lives because they're more real. If you're live, you can't edit it. You can't go back and fix it. It's, it's, more, it's, it's more genuine. So Facebook will push out the lives more so than it will other pieces of content that you've got. Now, there's, I mean, Facebook doesn't open the book and let us see what their algorithm is. They, they keep that pretty secret. But based on experience and based on research, this is, this is how it is today. That doesn't mean that it's not going to change tomorrow. This is a ever, ever changing field. So, but the Facebook lives, Facebook will push those out more to people who don't necessarily interact with your business otherwise than they will other content. And I will say in terms of Facebook lives, um, they can be very daunting. I personally have done a number of them and it does get easier. So it's definitely kind of a learning curve. You just have to feel a little bit more comfortable and it does get better. Okay. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it really does get easier. <laughs> it's very scary though to start. <laughs> it is. Okay. I know. <laughs> um, is it possible to go live on multiple platforms to double dip on the content? So you can if you use different tools. Um, we use one, and the name is escaping me at the moment. Um, we use one so that we can do it via Zoom where we have multiple people in locations and we can still do a Facebook Live and we can still see all the comments and everything. So yes, there are ways and I imagine we could probably push that to out to other platforms as well. We've not done that. Um, the vast majority of our business is on Facebook. So that's really where we focus. But yes, there are tools out there that will allow you to do stuff like that. I'm not sure if you used StreamYard but I do know that some businesses have used that. Um, and like you said, it's people coming from different places all over the state and they're able to film together. So I know that's a good right. one to use. Yep, StreamYard is good and I, it'll come to me, the, the other one that we use. We can send it out if, if it comes to you at some point. Um, some, someone said, we sell meat and are open, opening a processing facility. We have had issues with Facebook taking our posts down due to quote, selling animals. Can you speak on some tips to get around this other than avoiding the words altogether? Hey, Facebook is hard. And, and that's why I really said there at the end that you, for email marketing, you've got, you own your contacts with that. You've got to play by Facebook's rules with, with other businesses. And it is very difficult to get around They're They're using bots to go through these different posts and, if the bot picks up that word, then you're out. So really finding creative ways to, to word your, your posts are your best bet. There's, there's really no great way to avoid the bots uh, blocking your content, unfortunately. Okay. Um, what are options for obtaining an email listing of customers? So you can just ask your customers for their email addresses when they are doing business with you. Um, there's a great tool out there called King Sumo, which allows you to run um, a contest where you do a giveaway and it automatically collects and verifies email addresses for you. It gets people, they can get additional entries for just um, for liking your Facebook page or liking your Instagram page or your Twitter page. So it can get you additional likes on social, but it also gets you verified email addresses. Um, you gotta be a little careful when you send that out to make sure that it's going to the people that you want it to instead of somebody that's you know, halfway around the world where you can't ship to. But it, it is a way to grow your email marketing list and there's no cost for King Sumo. Um, you go on, sign up, create a giveaway and you're good to go. You can share it on social, you can send it out on, you know, you can put it on your webpage. There are a lot of ways to, to push that content out. Okay, this question, um, they have two different businesses. One is Lavender and one is USDA Beef. Um, on Facebook, they have two different business pages. On Instagram, could they combine the two and name the page our farm name or is it better to have two different business pages if you're doing two different um, products? It really depends on your customers. If your customers are customers of both businesses, it wouldn't hurt to do them together. 
if you have very different customers for each business, then you may want to keep them separate just so that you can post really engaging content for each clientele. Um, if, but if, if you've got the same customers for both businesses, I would simplify things and, and put it together. Um, when you're referring to posts that do better with a location, does it matter if it's my business or my local town? They are one and the same, but everyone may not know that. It, it really doesn't. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, I would probably do your local town before I did an address, um, just so that if somebody was searching for hashtag Somerset Kentucky, your, your business would, would come up as, as something that's used that hashtag. Um, someone commented, I think this is referring to the, um, the processing meat question. And they said, we have removed our recommendations to keep animal rights people from trolling. Is this a good idea? Probably. Um, unfortunately, we, there, there are, are people that have very, very strong opinions and think that other people need to know what those opinions are on social media. And there, there's just, it, it's really hard to filter them out. So if you can put things in, in place to where you have to approve comments before they show up, things like that, it can kind of help you police your page so that things don't show up when you don't want them to. Okay. I'll only ask you a few more questions because I know this is like an interview at this yeah, point. <laughs> you're good. Do you think it is worth it to boost your posts? Like paid content? In, in, some, in some instances, absolutely. Uh, you only want to boost a post that's doing really, really well, though. So don't boost a post that is getting very little um, interaction or engagement. Boost the post that's getting a ton of interaction and engagement. And I, I know that seems kind of counterintuitive, but if, if the post is doing really well on its own, throwing 5 or $10 at it is going to make it do a whole lot better because it's good content that people really like. If you're boosting a post that is getting poor, poor engagement, you're just kind of throwing your money down the drain because it's not, it, you're not going to see the return on it. So yeah, if you've got a post that is, is doing awesome and you're getting tons of people liking, commenting, sharing, those are the posts to boost. That's interesting. I would have thought the exact opposite as well. Yep. Okay, so someone said, we get lots of likes and engagement, but not necessarily getting people through our doors. Any suggestions? So a call to action is, is really the key here. You have to tell people exactly what you want them to do. Um, spell it out as crystal clear as you possibly can. If you want them to come see you, tell them, come see us. Make it very, very clear what you want them to do. Um, I know it's hard to agree with this, but people like direction and they like to be told what they're supposed to do. So just tell them and see if that makes a difference in, in the amount of traffic that you're getting. Okay. And then last question. Um, what is the best email list service in your opinion? So I use two. Um, for SCED, I use Constant Contact and it's great, but it is a little bit on the expensive side. For BBoss Online, I use MailChimp and MailChimp is much less expensive. It has a lot of the same functionality. Uh, kind of Constant Contact came around first and had more functionality initially and MailChimp has caught up with it. So if, if I was going to start a email list for a small business, I, I would use MailChimp uh, just because it is the lower cost. It does have great functionality. You can automate things and it, it will make your life easier. They've got great templates. They've got great stock photos. You've got a lot of options in there. Okay. If it's okay with you, we still have a number of questions, but we will make sure that we get to those. Amanda, I will send those your way and we can have those answered and sent out to everyone. Um, but just so you have a little bit of a breather, we will move on to our next presentation. So next we have, Jules. oh, actually we're going to do a um, quick poll. So if you have a moment to answer this, that would be great. Just so we have a little bit of knowledge about our registrants. And I'll just give you a few moments to answer that.
OK, while you all are answering that, we'll just give it a few more seconds. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So next we have Julie Fritsch, who is a business consultant and the owner of Julie Fritsch Creative. She specializes in creating marketing pieces for agriculture organizations and businesses and has spent her career immersed in Kentucky agriculture and marketing. She'll be talking about different effective marketing tools, content creation, and so much more. So stay tuned for that. Julie, are you ready to go? I'm ready if everybody else is ready. Um, thank you so much. Let me, let me share my screen here. Let's see. Okay, are we good? Looks great. Fantastic. All right, well, I am just so excited to speak to you guys tonight. And, you know, it's my hope that uh, in the next 20 to 25 minutes, everybody who's on this webinar is going to find at least one or two pieces of information that are going to be useful to you and help you get the most out of the time and the money um, that you're spending on your marketing. Uh, so a couple things before we get started. I do live out in the country and I have country internet. So if my face freezes up in a funny position or um, my internet connection gets unstable and I turn off my camera, um, I just want you to know that I've gotten together a handout. I know that the conference organizers have a plan to give that to you that they talked about at the beginning. You can also go to my website um, and download it. I put a button right on the front page so you can get a hold of all of the information that we're going to cover tonight. So again, I want to spend 20 to 25 minutes tonight. I want to cover a whole range of different things. If you have a question as I'm going through, if I go through something too quickly, just put a question in the question and answer box and we will get to as many of those as we can um, as we get to the end. So tonight I wanna cover three big things. One, I wanna talk briefly about making a plan that's gonna help you really kind of focus um, your marketing efforts. Uh, I wanna talk mostly about just like some tools and services that are either free or low cost because you know, it's one thing to um, talk theory, but it's another thing to actually know where to find these things. And then the third thing I want to touch on just briefly is um, sometimes with your marketing stuff, you may want to hire a professional. And so just some tips on how to decide whether or not you want to hire a professional to help with a certain part of your marketing and how to get the most out of that relationship if you do decide to do that. So just Real briefly about me, um, I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Foxport, which is in Fleming County. I love Fleming County. Eventually, I married and moved to a farm in Bourbon County. Uh, we raised beef cattle, hay, crops. Uh, my husband is an ag teacher here in Bourbon County. Uh, I've worked in cooperative extension. I worked in the greenhouse industry. I've been a freelance writer for most of my career. But um, I also worked for about a decade as the director of marketing and communications for the National Association of Ag Educators. Uh, and then about three years ago, I left and started Julie Fritch Creative. Um, it's just me, I'm a solo shop, but I work with all different sizes of ag clients, mostly in Kentucky, um, but some are scattered all throughout the United States. It's kind of what I do. So it's enough about me, let's talk about marketing. Um, the most efficient and effective thing that you can do with your marketing is to start with a plan. You know, and there may be some of you guys out there who already have a marketing plan, and there may be some of you who are watching this who feel like, you know, I, I don't really need a plan. I'm just getting started. I need a few things just to get me going. So we're just going to try to hit on the, the middle ground of that tonight, okay? What I want you to do, um, I really want to encourage you to create a document of some sort that is going to um, house some of the most important things about your business as it relates to marketing. It is important to have these things down so that you can evaluate your marketing efforts and adjust them as you need it, okay? Um, so let's talk about uh, just kind of setting a baseline that's going to help you guide your marketing efforts, all right? And there's really three categories that fall under this baseline um, that I think are important to have. And so I'm just going to name off a few things that you should um, consider when you are kind of putting together just kind of this basis for um, figuring out what your marketing is going to look like. So first, know yourself. What is it that we do? What are our company values? 
what sets us apart from other businesses in the same space? Like, what do we do better than anyone else? Okay. And then you got to know your customer. So who's my ideal customer? And the more clear picture that you can have of your ideal customer, the more effective you're going to be when you figure out, when you decide what it is that you want to do marketing wise. What's important to these people? What motivates them to act? Because that's what we want them to do is act. Where do they spend their time? And I'm talking about where do they spend their time online and, and where do they physically spend their time um, so that you know where to reach them. And then thirdly, um, kind of in this base of a plan, um, I want you to really work on getting in concrete the words and phrases that you're going to keep your language consistent and, and really keep you from reinventing the wheel every time you have to create a marketing asset, okay? This is things like, Talk about your elevator speech. When someone, a stranger comes up to you and says, what is it that you do? You need to have this very um, standard answer that covers all of the things that are critical to someone um, being impressed or being want to be a part of uh, your business. Um, what are the key points you want to express in every single communication? You know, maybe it's your mission statement. Maybe it's an objective. Or maybe it's just like a, a collection of phrases or keywords. You know, is it, fresh? Is it organic? Is it local? Is it, you know, are we trustworthy? Like, what are those phrases? And I really encourage you to get these things down. Um, I mean, post-it notes on your wall, a Word document, a yellow legal pad, however it is that you like to work. Starting with a plan is going to make you much more effective um, in the long run with marketing. So once you have this baseline, you can start to think about the things that are going to be effective marketing tools for you, okay? And so what I want you to do is keep a running list of your marketing efforts and the results because I want you to start to think about marketing your business as a cycle, okay? We're going to plan our marketing efforts. We're going to implement them. Then we're going to evaluate how they work, okay? That's a very important piece of it so that then we can refine what we did and we can kind of start that cycle all over again, okay? So, so now you've got this great plan. Now we need to talk about creating content. You know, I, I think anybody who's ever done anything marketing wise has been here. You know, you know, you need a website, you know, you need to post on Instagram, you know, you need to make a banner or whatever it is, but man, it's just hard to pull that stuff together and, and it takes a lot of time. Um, but everything that you make or do should reference those baseline principles that I just talked about. And now you haven't been writing. And so it's going to make your marketing just so much more effective. And it's going to prevent you from feeling like you're reinventing the wheel every time you have to do a marketing task. So these are the things when you start to, you've decided, okay, I think it's going to be effective to have an Instagram account. Or I think it's going to be effective to make some signs or banners or whatever it is. So these are the things I want you to ask yourself every time you do a marketing task. Who is my target for this? Hint, it should be your ideal customer, okay? Where does this need to be? Like, when you ask yourself where your ideal customer spends their time, this is going to help you determine whether you need to be on Twitter or you need to be on TikTok or if an ad banner at your little league field is going to be effective for you. It's going to help you figure out where, what kinds of things you need to do. And how does this item that I'm making make it easier for my ideal customer to take action? I mean, that's the key. You want to do everything you can to just put that product, whatever it is, right in their hand, okay? How does it make it easier for them to take action? Okay, so you made a banner and it's got your website on it. When they go to your website, then what? A few more questions. How will I measure how effective this is? If you're not measuring the effectiveness of your marketing efforts, you're really just doing expensive craft projects. I mean, you have to measure how effective it is and figure out what your return on investment is. And when you're thinking about your return on investment on marketing things, be sure to factor in your time. It is the most valuable thing. There is no one who can do the things that you do. So be sure to factor in your time when you're thinking about costs and it comes to marketing, okay? And how does this fit into my overall plan? Another big question, how can I reuse this item, okay? If it's a graphic, if it's a banner, if it's a, you know, any piece of thing that you make, that you spend time or money on, 
how can I make it evergreen? Should I take some dates off? Can I laminate something? You know, how can I make this something that I can use in multiple places? All right, let's talk about some tools, okay? I wanna give you just a rundown of tools and tips that I hope that you're gonna find useful. These are things that I have used. Um, you know, there are so many options out there, but these are just some things that I've used in the past and have found useful. Okay, getting organized. If you, especially if you are a person who lives off of your cell phone, um, I would really recommend that you think about Evernote. Um, it is a note-taking app um, and you can do text notes, audio notes, you can attach pictures. Um, it organizes everything into notebooks, sort of like kind of like folders. It can be synced across devices. It, the basic plan is free. Um, there are paid premium options. I've used Evernote for a long time, never had the need to, to go with the premium plan. It's very useful. LastPass is a cloud-based um, kind of a uh, password um, security kind of a thing. So it securely keeps all those passwords that you have to have for all of your social media accounts and all of those things um, in one spot. And it's free with paid premium options. Pinterest boards, the reason that I put this up here, I mean, if you're on Pinterest, you know, but if you're not on Pinterest, um, it really is a good way to organize visual material and you can make your boards private. So you can just basically collect all this pictures of things off the web, you know, off the web and you can save them to these boards and you can even share them with other people that you're, that you're planning things with. And of course it's free. Um, pictures. So we, you guys are in one of the most photogenic businesses that there is. I mean, just, you know, if, if I could encourage you to do one thing, it would be to take more pictures, get in the habit of taking pictures of everything that you do. You know, our last presenter just talked about how much people love to see behind the scenes photos of what is going on. There are some things that you can do um, to set up your cell phone camera to take the best pictures possible. Cell phones take such great pictures now um, that it is really just, I mean, there's almost, there's, there, unless you just love to take pictures, there's very little need um, for anything beyond a, a cell phone camera when we're talking about taking pictures to use on social media or even print kinds of things, okay? So a few quick tips to help you get the most out of your cell phone camera. And number one, turn on your composition grid. So you can see on the slide that I have up on the screen, these bars that go across, this is your composition grid. And this is um, uh, dividing your screen um, into thirds, essentially. And so um, this is gonna help, there's a principle that's gonna, that says that if you are taking a picture and you place the, the subject of your picture along one of these third lines, um, it's going to make it much more visually appealing. So that's just one easy thing that you can do. Turn off your flash. Natural light is usually much softer and, and makes much more interesting pictures. Check the resolution on your camera. Um, you're gonna wanna be sure that you're taking pictures in the highest resolution that you can uh, because it would be really disappointing to take this awesome picture and then you can't use it on your website or you can't use it um, in print materials because it's not high enough resolution. Um, touch to focus. So like when you hold up your camera to take a picture, just touch the area that you want to focus on. And what that's going to do on almost all cameras is it's going to allow that camera to understand where it needs to focus and, and take the best possible picture of, of what you're trying to take a picture of. And my last tip on that is don't use your zoom. Just get as close as possible to whatever it is that you're trying to take a picture of. And then use your camera software to crop out anything that you want to crop out. You're going to end up with a much higher quality picture in the long run. So now you got all these awesome pictures and you know, you wanna organize them. So, you know, I really love Google Photos. You'll see as we go through tonight, I use a lot of Google products because they are, they're free. Um, Google Photos, it's free, it's unlimited. It's designed to store your photos, okay? And so you can download the Google Photos app onto your phone. You can set it so that you're, when you take pictures, they automatically upload. And so they're backed up to the cloud then. 
they're organized by date, but you can also organize them by, um, you can put them into albums, you know, that kind of thing. And the thing that I really love about Google Photos is it has this intuitive search. So you can see on the screen that I pulled up my Google Photos account and just typed in cow. And so it pulled up all the pictures I had of, of cows. Um, you can, it also has this thing that as you add more photos, it, it starts to identify people and pets that you take pictures of a lot and it just starts to group them together. So it just makes it easier to find the pictures. So when you're making that social media post or you're looking for that certain picture, it just makes it easier to find the things that you're trying to find. At some point you may want to use stock photos um, or some kind of stock graphics and I'm sure that you guys all um, understand that you can't just Google and use any picture that you find online because of copyright issues, but Google does have some tools that makes it easier to um, get pictures that are allowable um, to be used in your marketing. And what you're going to be looking for are pictures that are licensed under the Creative Commons license, okay? So when you go to Google and you type in a search, so here I've typed in Hayfield. What you want to do is click on your images tab and click on the tools button. You can see I have the big red one beside it. That's going to bring up kind of another um, level of tools, that size, color, type. And, and under usage rights, you can select Creative Commons licenses. And Creative Commons license is used when an author wants to give other people the right to use their work. Okay, so you know that you are um, able to use those stock photos on your social media or, or in the marketing things that you're building, okay? Some other sources that I use sometimes if I need stock photos, Pexels, Unsplash, these are websites, creativecommons.org. Flickr is actually a good place to find um, some, some nice Creative Commons type uh, pictures and you can also filter those to make sure that you're getting ones that are allowable for commercial use, so. Social media. Um, Canva, I think, is a really, really handy tool. Again, it's free. Um, basically, Canva can help you create correctly sized graphics for social media, but it also um, has templates and, and tools to help you make flyers, um, all kinds of different things. Um, and these pre-made templates kind of help you work faster. It saves your work so you can kind of go back and, and repurpose the things that you had. Um, it's so handy, you know, it is free. There are premium options available. I actually went ahead and subscribed to the premium options because I thought that it was so handy. Um, it has things like the ability to create a graphic, say for Facebook, and then with a click of a button, you can just resize that to be the right size for Instagram or Twitter or whatever. So it's a really good tool. Um, Adobe Spark Video Maker. Um, this is used to make short videos, like really good videos for social media. So not so much like TikTok videos, but more like explainer videos, or like if you wanted to make like a video that had a few graphics with it, that, those kinds of videos. If you look for this online, make sure that you look for the Adobe Spark Video Maker, because Adobe Spark is actually like a whole suite of tools that they want to charge for, but the Video Maker is free. Um, and don't overlook your in-app scheduling tools for social media. I know our last speaker just talked a lot about that, um, but you know, if you have a Facebook page and an Instagram account, you can connect those together and you can actually schedule posts for both platforms through your Facebook publishing tools. And then Twitter also has an in-app scheduler. Um, it's, you go to ads. you log into your Twitter account, go to ads.twitter.com and, and you'll find that there. All right, email marketing. We just talked a lot about email marketing in the, the previous presentation about what how great it is if it's a good fit with your ideal client. It's a it's a really valuable tool. MailChimp and Constant Contact are the ones that, that I recommend as well. MailChimp is great because it's free up to a thousand contacts, I believe. So as long as your list is under a thousand, MailChimp is free. So printing. So there will be times when you want to get things printed. Um, my first recommendation is to look for a really good local print shop. You know, it's the best option for repeat business. It's great to support a local business, but also they're really going to care about the quality of what it is that they're that, that you're having printed. If you're somewhere though um, that maybe you have access to like a Staples or a FedEx or like an Office Depot, their print centers are good sometimes. 
Um, they're fast. Sometimes they're the least expensive option, but you have to watch because sometimes they're more expensive. And Staples and Office Depot have like this blueprint printing option where you can print really large scale uh, graphics. I mean, I'm talking about like poster size graphics for really cheap, you know, maybe like five bucks a print or something. So if that's something that you need, that's a place to look. If you want to look online, U Printing and Vistaprint are a couple that I have used for a long time. They're inexpensive, they're reliable, everything's always been good quality that I've gotten from them. You can get a huge variety of printed materials from them. I mean, I'm talking everything from, um, you know, flyers to cards to, you know, whatever you can think of. Stickers are really popular right now. I really like Sticker Mule, inexpensive, good quality, great customer service fast turnaround. Um, and the thing I like about Sticker Mule, because I really love a good deal, is if you sign up for their emails, they send out, I think it's weekly or maybe every other week, um, like all of like these um, kind of specials where you can try out smaller quantities of some of their different stickers for a uh, less expensive price. So I really like that about Sticker Mule. Um, if direct mail is something that you're considering, um, again, I would think about a local print shop because a lot of times these places will offer um, printing and bulk mailing service kind of all rolled into one and that's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, websites. So um, WordPress is going to be a website that is going to be a little bit more complex to set up, but it's going to be basically unlimited as far as the number of options that you can add, the way that you can reconfigure your site, all of those kinds of things. If you have a WordPress site, you're gonna to need to have a host, like a hosting service. And I really like SiteGround. Um, they have great web hosting. They're up, you know, the, their websites stay up um, most of the time. Um, they're fairly inexpensive and they have really good customer service. GoDaddy, it's been around forever. I like it for domain registration and for email. Like if you're setting up your business email, they have really good customer service. They're not great for hosting your website. You know, they can be a little bit slow. Um, and if you're looking for kind of an all-in-one kind of a thing to set up your website, places like Squarespace or Weebly or even Wix, and it's easy to get your website up and going. They're easy to update. They're definitely um, good options if you think that you're going to have just a pretty basic, straightforward kind of a website. Definitely something that you can do yourself. All right. The last um, point that I want to touch on is data. Um, so these are some different places that you can find data about the marketing efforts that you put in place. OK, so the first one is Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is a free service that you can connect, essentially like connect it to the back end of your website. OK, so um, it offers free in-depth analysis of your site. I mean, it will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about the people who are coming to your website. It will tell them, tell you what they do once they're there. It will tell you where they click, where they go, how much time they spend looking at different parts of your page. It can be very complex. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit hard to understand, um, but it is a very powerful tool. Google Alerts. This isn't data exactly, but I wanted to throw it in there because uh, it's worth mentioning. So um, go to alerts.google.com. And you can set up um, an alert from basically it's like a roundup of all of the news and all of the stuff out there on the web related to a chosen keyword. So like say I wanted to get Google alerts about beats. So I'd type in beats and I'd say, okay, send me an email once a week, everything on the web that comes up about beats. So I get this synopsis in my email once a week about all of the different news stories related to that. And this is going to be a really good tool when you're looking for stuff to create content um, for your social media, or you just want to keep an eye on different topics. Um, social media analytics, don't overlook them. We've talked about them a lot in the previous session, but you know, for basic analysis, your in-app analytics are really good resources. Um, you know, again, Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, I'll have really pretty good Pretty good analytics uh, right in the app. And then um, when you're trying to figure out, when I said that you need to evaluate your marketing efforts, okay, so one of the things that you may end up doing is surveys, okay? So Google Forms is a good way to do that. They're free. 
Um, if you know anybody under the age of like 18, they've been on virtual school for the last year, so they can show you easily how to set that up. Um, but you can set it up yourself too, it's very easy. Um, there are other survey options out there. SurveyMonkey is one, Alchemer is one. They have free for the basic you know, service, and then there are paid premium options. And sometimes just good old, you know, pencil and paper when you see people in person is a good way um, to, you know, spend some time evaluating your marketing efforts and, and just kind of seeing how they meant. All right. The last thing that I want to touch on tonight, should I hire a professional and how to get the most out of them if you do? So, you know, marketing is not rocket science. You know, I feel 100% confident that every person on this webinar tonight is perfectly capable of handling their own marketing. I mean, you guys have your own businesses. Um, you know, but sometimes when you start to factor in your time, it makes sense to think about hiring a professional and outsourcing some of those tasks. And because it's not something that folks necessarily do every day, it can be a little bit intimidating. Um, so here are some things to consider when you're thinking about, should I hire a professional for this or not? Okay, basically it comes down to a very simple equation. The cost of your time to do this marketing effort versus the cost of hiring a professional. Okay, you need to understand how much a professional typically will cost you. Evaluate how much time you think realistically you think you're going to spend on this. And then maybe, you know, add a little bit more for problems that you run into and think, okay, this is something I can do myself or I really don't want to spend the time on this. Maybe I'll hire a professional. Some other things to consider, you know, is this really a core part of the marketing that I want to do? Like, would this be an evergreen item? You know, are we talking about like branding? Are we talking about my logo here that I'm going to have on every single thing um, that goes out? Or is this really just something that I want to try once uh, and it may or may not work? You know, that, that if it's an evergreen core thing, that's the time that you might start to think about hiring a professional to make something for you. So if you do decide to go with a professional, um, here are some tips um, for finding the right partner for that, okay? So get really clear on exactly what it is that you want before you look for someone to do the job, okay? You need to understand exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish. And then that's going to help you find somebody who's a good fit for you, your business, and for the job, you know, the task at hand, because not every marketing person is going to be good at everything, and then take the time to really talk to that person or a couple of people um, before you commit. You know, talk through the project, talk through your expectations, and make sure that you guys really fit together well. Um, be really clear and realistic about your timeline. You know, that means like firm dates. This is when I want to first draft. Um, this is, you know, when we're going to do revisions and I have to have a final by X date. And then last but not least, get a proposal in writing. And that proposal needs to have the deliverables. So it needs to say exactly what you're going to get down to the file type, you know, the quantity, the, you know, whatever it is that you're having made. Get the due dates and get the cost in writing. So if you've hired somebody, here are a few tips for, you know, kind of getting the results that, that you want. All right. Be as detailed as possible about your project. If you see things that you really like, like examples, those are wonderful to kind of gather and share. Gather anything you need to provide in advance or as quickly as possible after you, you know, sign that agreement. You know, if you have a six week timeline to work on something um, and, and you get started, but it takes four weeks for you to gather up all the pictures to, to get to the person so they can make your website or whatever it is, you know, that's going to really throw a wrinkle in that. So gather all of your materials kind of before you get started, if you can. Um, communicate regularly, clearly, and in writing so that you can go back to the, the communications that you've had and say, mm, you know, I know you thought this, but here's where we, you know, said something different. Understand the revision process. And by that, I mean, especially if you're working with, say, like a graphic designer or somebody like that, a lot of times you'll have so many opportunities for revision and then they start to charge you hourly after that. So like if you're having a logo designed, it's very direct um, that you'll get to see like two or three options, then you get three rounds of revisions and after that they start charging you by the hour. So just understand those things going in and then be sure it's right before you give final approval. It's okay to hang on to that stuff for a few days and really be sure that it's right 
before you approve it, because if you approve it and it goes to print or it goes live or whatever it is and there's a typo or there's something wrong, it's hard to go back from that because you gave the final approval. Here's how to squeeze out just a little bit more um, than, than maybe what just what you want. So you might consider if you hire somebody and they're a good fit and you, you think you know you like them, ask them for their input. Hopefully they've done a lot of other projects, kind of like the one that you're doing. So ask them for their input and see what they have to say. Doesn't mean you have to do it, it just means you're getting their input. Ask for a style guide. So if you're getting something that is, for instance, a logo or even a brochure, a flyer, something like that, ask them to provide you with the exact colors and the fonts and all of that stuff that they use. You know, um, they will send that to you and then you have it on file and you can use it when you make something the next time. And also ask if it can be put into a format that you can update yourself. So, you know, if you're having a price sheet made or if you're, you know, uh, whatever it is, ask them if it can be designed in a way that you can update. So that's, that's I think, um, really key. All right. So I ran through a lot of different things and what felt like a short amount of time. And so now we have time for questions. Okay. We do have a number of questions. Okay. Um, so which website would you recommend to use for USDA beef and pork products? Do you mean like to, I'm not sure, like to, to market them? I'm, I believe to market them. Did you, you know, have, I, I know you had a list of websites, but any of them that you would recommend over the other for that. Right. Okay. So, so from that perspective, I think probably um, what you're going to want to think about is if, if this is something that I'm going to want to open my own online store. Um, so if that's kind of the, the, the question that you're asking, WordPress is going to be um, your most versatile option. But Squarespace, Weebly, Wix, those kinds of places do have um, online store type options. It's just that they are uh, less, you know, less customizable, I guess I would say. So I think probably to start, honestly, if it was me and I thought that I was going to have to design it myself and I was going to have to keep up with it myself, I would try to see if a Squarespace, Weebly, Wix kind of a thing would work first. And if it's not doing what I would want it, what I want it to do, then I would move to a WordPress setup. Okay. Um, can you talk more about how to use the alerts information? Sure. So if you go to, let me show you, let's see here. If I go to, I'm going to just share a different part of my screen, but uh, that's okay. So, so what I was going to say is if you go to alerts.google.com and basically all you have to do is just type in the keyword um, that you want to keep an eye on, um, you know, and so for instance, if I wanted to get a roundup of all of the news that was coming out about, you know, honeybees or a certain kind of bourbon or whatever that is, I just type that keyword in um, and then I, you know, it'll ask me, do I want to get this via email or do I want to get it via, via an RSS feed? Um, you probably want to want to get it e via email and then you can um, set the options for how frequently you want to get it. You can get it every day. You might even be able to get it more than, than once a day um, uh, or less frequently. And then it's just delivered directly to your email. And basically it's just a bunch of, um, you know, little kind of synopses of, of, uh, of news articles and, and different things that are rounded up from all across the web uh, about that topic. And Cindy sent that um, in the chat. So if you were curious about that, the link is right there. Um, so how much time would you recommend budgeting weekly for marketing outreach for your ag business? Sure, that's a great question. So it really depends on the size of your business. Um, 
I think that a good place to start would be, you know, I'm just thinking about kind of what I think of as like a typical small farm, you know, just starting out kind of an ag business. If you have a good plan in place, I would think if, if you budget 10 hours a week to do marketing, you are really going to be able to get um, some, some things done there. Because the idea is to make um, your marketing uh, kind of focused and efficient enough that you implement these things and then you're spending time kind of evaluating how they went. Now, when you're talking about marketing, like the kinds of things like social media, rather than doing it like in one 10 hour chunk each week, although you can do that because, you know, you can schedule your posts, you can, um, you know, create all of these graphics at once, you can do those kinds of things. I would suggest 20 to 30 minutes each day, even, even less time than that, honestly, just depending on how many social media platforms you have. Um, so say you're on Facebook and Instagram. One day, get on your Facebook page, spend 10 minutes looking through, you know, the, the accounts of your, of your top fans, engaging with people who have engaged with you on your page, you know, following other places that, that do things that you're interested in, you know, as a page the next day, get on Instagram and do the same thing. And so it, the idea is just to be consistent and steady. And so thinking about budgeting time, a little bit of time each day, I think it's going to be a little bit more effective in that kind of an arena um, than it is, you know, like one big chunk of time. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on using platforms like Farmers Web, Barnador, Harvey, Farmago, those kinds of things for selling products? Sure. Um, I think that they can really, they can be very uh, advantageous. It depends on, I know that on some of those, I'm not familiar with all of them, but I am familiar with a few of those. Um, the cost to sell on those is pretty expensive, you know, like kind of the cut that they take. Um, so that's really going to be something that you're going to want to evaluate um, before you make the commitment to do that. Um, honestly, sometimes it's a trade-off between do, am I willing to have them take more of a cut from uh, my sales because it's saving me time and because I know that it's going to be um, you know, an attractive, effective uh, kind of a platform to be on? Or do I want to spend a little more time, you know, kind of building it myself on my own website, doing my own, you know, kind of social media promotion, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's really a trade-off. Uh, I do think that they do have their place and that they do work well um, and a lot of times what's so nice about those kinds of things is the customer service. Okay, switching gears just a little bit. Um, so what would be a baseline cost to have a logo and style guide designed? If you're looking for a professional, I think that you could probably expect to spend, if you're just talking about not a full marketing plan, you really are just talking about a logo and a style guide. I think you're probably going to talk probably think about about $200. Um, anybody who's below that is probably, you know, maybe fairly new um, or is just like kind of looking to build their business. You can find places that will charge you much, much more than that. But I think right around that $200, $250 mark is, is probably what you can expect to spend. Okay. And then last question for the current time being, um, how do you find who your top fans on social media are? Okay, you know, Amanda may actually want to be the person that answers this, but um, if you go onto your Facebook page into, I know that from your Facebook page, you can go into community, I think is the, the name of the tab um, there. And when you look on your community, it will show you who your top fans are. And those are the, you know, and of course that changes depending on who is interacting with your posts, but that's how you can find that on Facebook. Um, on Instagram, I'm not sure that how to find it 
you know, through analytics like that. Um, but if you're on Instagram and you're kind of interacting kind of on that, you know, slow and steady pace, like I was talking about, um, it'll, those folks will kind of rise to the top pretty quickly and you'll be able to identify them, you know, pretty well. Amanda, do you want to chime in there? Okay. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with exactly what you said, Julie. All right. Do you guys mind if I jump in real quick? Please. Since we are here, like almost at the end of time, we told people we would be. Um, if you don't mind, would you all stay on and continue to answer some questions? And then any of our folks that need to hop off can do that and then they can pick up the recorded webinar. Do you mind? Yeah, so I don't mind. Stick around? Okay, because we do still have so many questions in the Q&A and in the chat that we would love to get, like, rather than a written answer, it would be great to hear you give those answers. So just want to tell all of our participants, if you have to jump off, you know, please do, but we would love for you to stick around as long as you want to. And as long as you have questions, um, you know, I, I do want to just remind everybody, you know, these are being recorded. Um, you know, you can watch them later if you want to go back and review or you want to catch something that you missed. And speaking of things you might have missed, I want to apologize for those that had trouble um, getting into the session. We have been learning so much about Zoom and different technologies. And so we really appreciate your patience and your grace with us because um, everything didn't work perfectly today. Hopefully you thought it did, but you know we had a few little um, stumbles behind the scenes. And um, so we appreciate the feedback to help us um, diagnose those issues and be able to fix them. So hopefully tomorrow when you join, it'll just be a simple click on the link and you'll be right on into the Zoom. But did want to remind everybody, all this is recorded. So if you miss something, you can definitely go back um, and look. And that is enough of me talking. Um, I want to hear more from Julie and Amanda. I have a whole list of notes and things that like we've got to do, like from a court counsel standpoint. Um, so Bethany, back to you to moderate and ask the questions. Um, lots of things in the chat and um, in the Q&A. So um, both of you, um, Julie and Amanda, feel free to hop in and answer the questions. Some really, really good ones there. Yeah, I have um, pages of notes in between answering some of the things in the chat and, you know, working behind the scenes. So I'm so excited to go back and rewatch everything because I took pictures on my phone and there's so many things that we can implement, like Cindy said. So going back to just a few more questions, um, Julie, one for you was, I sell baked goods. Should I hire a professional to help my products, get my products in specialty or grocery stores? Well, you know, I hate, I hate to keep saying this, but it all comes down to time. So if you want to focus on, um, you know, if you need to focus on product de development and on just like production, um, that is a time that you may consider hiring someone to go around and take your product to, to grocery stores or specialty stores um, and promoting it. However, I will say this, with most specialty products, especially ag specialty products, I think that what a lot of people are really attracted to is the personal aspect and the fact that they know the person who is producing it and um, that craft kind of a trust, you know, all of those kinds of things, the story behind it. And no one's gonna tell that better than you. Uh, and so if you, can, if you can do that, you know, if you're the person that takes your products around and talks to those um, key folks in, in those spots, nothing's gonna be more powerful than that. I mean, you can hire somebody to do that for you and, and hopefully you can find a good person and they'll do a great job. Um, but I do think that a key part of direct marketed, especially ag products is, is the story behind it. I think that's worded perfectly. Um, is there a website, this could be for either of you, but is there a website or resource that you would recommend to learn how to use hashtags effectively? I actually, I've got a, a class on DBoss Online that, that covers hashtags and explaining exactly what they are and, and how to how to utilize them. So if, if that person wants to reach out to me, I can make sure they get that content. You know, at minimum, I would say, you know, put a hashtag into the social 
media that you are thinking about using it on and just see what comes up. Um, sometimes you might be surprised. Uh, you know, I've, I know I have been a couple of times. So, so that, that's the baseline, but that sounds like a great option, Amanda. Would you recommend having a Facebook group to accompany your Facebook business page? I have used in the past so customers could post pictures of things, but it gets to be a lot to keep up. What are your thoughts? It, I, it depends on what you're doing. Um, for boutiques, if you've got like a VIP club, the groups are great. Um, you know, it, if, if you want to kind of separate your, your best customers from general public, then I think it's useful. Um, it is, it does add more to keep up with for sure. And I think too, I mean, if they are tagging you in a social media or things like that, you can always share that to your own page and save yourself all the work from that. That's just my personal opinion. We've done that. Um, Okay, so Amanda, going back to what you were talking about with doing Facebook Lives, um, what if you don't get a lot of people coming to the lives? That's okay. Actually, you know, we'll, some, we, we did a Facebook Live um, last week, and the weather was bad, and people were, were trying to figure out where kids were going, and, I, you know, we only had a handful of people on there. But people go back and watch those. So certainly don't get discouraged if you don't have a hundred people watching your live. That's okay. People have other things to do too, <laughs> but doing the Facebook live gets it pushed out to other people after the fact too. So it's not all about the, the immediate interaction. A lot of times it's after the fact that those, those things occur. Okay. Any recommendations on dealing with a bad review or negative comments? Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if, if you get a bad review or negative comment, the best thing to do is to reach out and say, you know what, I'm really sorry you had a bad experience. I would love to have a conversation with you about it and respond publicly, but then take it offline as quickly as possible because some people are crazy and they're going to complain about something no matter what. And you don't want to do that publicly. But if you reach out and say, you know what, let's talk about this. Call me, come in, whatever then it shows people that you care that you're paying attention to this. But then whatever happens afterwards is offline. Okay. Um, another one, Amanda. So does King Sumo offer a way to limit the location on the front end, or do you have to go through the locations after the emails have been gathered? So it doesn't let you filter locations on the front end, but depending on where you share it to really determines who's going to find it. So if you've got a pretty tight-knit Facebook community where people are in your general vicinity or our clients, customers, they're the ones that are going to see that you've put that contest out there. So you're occasionally going to get somebody from out of the area, but maybe they travel to your area on occasion and really are interested in receiving your information. So I... Honestly, I, I wouldn't filter it. If they sign up, I'd leave them on your email list. You never know. Okay. Julie, a question for you. So you're talking about um, like SurveyMonkey and things like that. Do you have any tips for how to get those responses? Because I know personally with KHC, we do sometimes struggle. Um, personally, I don't usually fill out surveys. So is, do you have any tips for enticing people to actually fill those out? Sure. Yeah, that actually is a great point. You know, even even I don't fill those out all of this, all the time. But I'll tell you, um, any the tips that I would have would be keep it short, um, keep it very easy for people to click on. And I'm talking like two or three questions. I know you probably have a million questions that you want to ask people, but they're probably only going to answer two or three, and then they're just going to close out anyway. Um, if you can offer some kind of an incentive, you know you know, you know, take this survey and be entered in a drawing, you know, those kinds of things, those do help if your incentive is, is, you know, attractive to people. And then the reason that I mentioned like the good old fashioned pen and paper kind of a survey, it's, it is really effective if you can just ask people, like, even if you don't have an actual survey, if you just go into one of those kinds of situations, you know, like if you're at farmer's market or, you know, that, that kind of thing 
where you can ask people some really targeted questions. Maybe it's one different question that you ask all of your customers each week or something. That can be an effective way to kind of get the information that you want. So just be really, really targeted and, and think about, I mean, we're all creatures of, you know, kind of got the same thing. So think about how you feel when people send you surveys, um, except for the survey about these sessions, you know, we all want to fill that out. But, but yeah, think about how, the, how you would respond and, and try to stick to things that are going to make it not um, a big task for people to do. I think that's great. Yeah. Except this survey, everyone's going to fill out this survey, right? Of course. <laughs> um, another one for you, Julie, have you ever used the Google website maker through Google business? And if you have, would you recommend it? I have never used it. Um, and so I, I, I can't say one way or the other, you know, and that's, right. that's the thing. There are a million, million resources out there. Just so many um, and if I could say one thing about free resources is that sometimes you get to use them and then all of a sudden the thing that you loved about them is behind a paywall. So just be prepared for that when you use like a free or a low cost resource. So. Bethany, I have used the, the Google website with mm -hmm. Google My Business and it, it's okay. It's incredibly basic and you have very, very limited um, customization options. So if you have no other, you know, if, if building a website just scares you and you want something super simple, it's a good way to go, but it is super simple. Gotcha. Okay. Um, one to you, Amanda, if you're selling wholesale, would you want a separate email list for direct marketing customers? So yeah. And with MailChimp and Constant Contact, you can put people into uh, categories to where you can choose, you know, I cover 45 counties in Kentucky. And when I send out something, it doesn't need to go out to all 45 counties. So I have people in, in different zones and you can put your wholesalers in a zone. You can put your retail customers in a zone. And, and that way you can, you can make sure that the emails that are going out are specific to that group. Um, another one for you. So someone had asked earlier, um, is posting your location important if you're selling nationally? And someone said um, where, they're at, where they're from, Verona, Kentucky, might scare people if they don't know about that. So is that something still that you would want to do? If, if what you're doing is marketing locally, absolutely, it's something you wanna do. If you're selling more nationally and if, if your location doesn't really have an effect on what you're marketing, then it's not as important. It's just a way to increase engagement for for posts but if you know if you're if you're national and you don't want to to put Kentucky on there then then you can leave it off but it's just a way to increase traffic for a local business okay gotcha um someone asked where can they find help automating their MailChimp account I believe that so, yeah, that would just be in the MailChimp account like, like how to, how to make an automated email within MailChimp? I believe so. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, MailChimp has tutorials in, in their, their site that can walk you through that. I've, I've got, I cover it in Bboss as well. That's another, another thing that we talk about, but it's, it's really, it's not complicated. I promise. Gotcha. Okay. Um, if anyone has any more questions that they want to send our way, please feel free to do so. Um, if any get sent to us via email or social media, we'll be sure to pass those on. Um, you all saw the contact information for both Julie and Amanda, but we'll be sending that again as well. So if you have any final questions, send those through now. Oh, I think one popped up. Oh, someone said, not really a question, but a comment. A great resource is your public library. Um, ours in Kenton County will help you one-on-one -on -one with technology. So that's a good point. And then someone said, is it better to keep protein and produce separate due to targeting by certain groups? So like if someone is a vegetarian or vegan, is it better to, I'm wondering if that's better to keep like their pages separate, which I think we answered that in a previous question. Um, yeah, if ladies, do you have any input on that? Um, um. I'll be honest with you, I, making that type of determination is kind of out of my, my expertise. I don't know the customer base well enough to, to be able to say yes or no. 
yeah, I think that's probably an up to the producer. Yeah, I would say that it, I agree. It, I think it's kind of all about your story. So what is the story that, what are your business values? What is the story you want to tell as a business? You know, is it that we pr provide both protein and vegetables or is it, you know, two separate stories that you're trying to tell? So maybe if you think about it that way, it might help you make that decision. Okay. Okay, and then the final question for tonight. So we are stuck on likes. We aren't getting new followers. I can't personally invite any more suggestions to reach new people. Um, by boosting posts, it gets it in front of people who don't typically see your stuff. Um, it, making sure that people understand, you know, if you if they share your post on their page, it helps your business. Uh, people like to help businesses. And if, if you give them an easy way to help a business, typically they will do it. So if you just say, hey, it would, suit, it would help us a ton if you would share this post. Now, don't do that on every post. Don't do it every day, but occasionally it's okay. Ask for help. Ask, ask your best customers to help you get the word out there to new people. Yeah, that is great. Um, we found that has helped a lot with growing our page personally, um, just people sharing and liking and you know, even if they're not buying your product, just sharing it out there can spread it to so many people. So that was a great question. Thank you so much everyone for your questions and for participating tonight. Um, thank you, Amanda and Julie. This has been amazing. Like I said, I will be going back and taking even more notes. We've had lots of people saying they have four pages of notes from tonight. So that is great. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. So everyone, like we said, sorry if there was any kind of confusion or struggle with Zoom tonight. Um, the link will be the same for all three nights. So you'll be receiving another email. But if you have any trouble or anything, please send us um, a direct message or an email and hopefully there will be less problems tomorrow. But we look forward to seeing everyone and thank you so much again for joining us and we will see you tomorrow. So thank you everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.